And so this Christmas season, we have been together looking at how God is with us. And if God is with us, then in Christ, there are specific gifts that Jesus brings. And so last week, Pastor Barry brilliantly taught us how in Christ, everyone say in Christ, we can receive a love that conquers fear. Not that there isn't fear, but that the fear doesn't conquer us, that the love that we receive in Christ can conquer that fear. And today, everyone take your hand and put it on your gut. I'm not making a comment about it. I'm just simply, I'm not. I'm just simply saying, today is more caught than taught. It's more about connecting to something in here that sometimes we don't want to acknowledge that we need to acknowledge because of the connection between the gift today is the gift of joy in grief, in loss. For some of you, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Everything couldn't be better, and we celebrate that. That's extraordinary. Yet for others of you, this Christmas will be profoundly different, perhaps because of somebody who isn't here who once was. Maybe it's a battle that you are going through with your health. Maybe in the last couple of years, you've had financial difficulty unlike perhaps any other season. Maybe your family once was this way, now it is different. And in there, there is grief and there is loss. And here's the temptation. The temptation is to allow that to overwhelm us. But when we feel it on the inside, it is actually this place where God wants to meet us. We make room for God in all things, including this place. How many of you know that traditions around Christmas can make you happy? Like you can love the Christmas movies, you can love the carols, you can love the lights, you can love everything about it. But by about January this year, 7th or 8th, it's all going to be back in boxes. It's all going to be gone. And so if our rooted joy is in the external stuff, then it's temporary at best. It's fleeting at best. It's circumstantial at best. And part of the way in which God, I think, is pruning and leading his church, even through the last few years, is to reject hype but long for hope. To no longer just be satisfied with the noise of what is and to long for something deeper. Not just surface stuff, but things of ultimate substance. This is where God, I believe, is moving afresh. He only prunes to bear greater, deeper fruit. And so the pain of what is is always in the hope of what would be. And this we experience only in seasons of grieving and of loss. But in these seasons that we find ourselves, we can fall prey to fighting against one another, criticizing one another, tearing one another down. And I'm not talking about calling out things that need to be called out. I'm not speaking about that, but I'm talking about doing so in a spirit that is not to build but destroy. These are things and areas that you and I can get caught of, and there's a specific temptation that we want to look at today. In the very first Christmas story, there's the hint that you'll see of Zechariah and Elizabeth who experienced the joy of conception. But if you read the story, the joy of their conception is only found following years of infertility and the disappointment of why not, why not us, why not us, why not us. It is this deep connection between what wasn't to what is. It is the longing of their hearts and the meeting of God's purpose. And so today we want to take an odd turn, but an intentional turn, to look at a story to give hope in Christ for each and every one of us. You know, Christmas is not just about a baby. We'll sing it on this upcoming Saturday on Christmas Eve. He is Lord at his birth. He doesn't become Jesus. He is Jesus. He doesn't become God. He is God. He doesn't become Lord. He is Lord. It's who he is. He grows, yes, in wisdom and in stature, no question. But we worship not a cute little baby. We worship a king. And so sometimes it's important to fast forward into his life to look back at really what it is that he has come to do. 
And today we want to read the shortest verse in the Bible, which provides really big insight to help us find this deeper place where that kind of joy <laughs> resides, okay? The shortest verse is this. It's two words. You ready? I don't know if she's crying or laughing. I just thought she was laughing. If she's, if she's crying, that's not the joy you want, but that's okay. Two words. You ready? Jesus, he wept. Two words. Jesus wept. John chapter 11, verses 35, Jesus weeps. Men, you're all right, you can cry. <laughs> real men don't cry. I don't have actually any desire to be like a real man, I just wanna be like Jesus, and he cried, so <laughs> it's enough for me. You can take your other patriarchal junk and you can keep it, I wanna be like Christ. And it says that Jesus wept, he weeps, doesn't say that he just like dabs a tear. It says that he weeps. And John 11 is actually a really weird story. It's actually a little bit of a difficult story to first grasp because if you know the story, well, I'll tell you the story in a second here, but this verse in John chapter 11 and verse 35 actually precedes a miracle that Jesus is about to perform. And so the question should be, like, like if I was about to perform, if I was walking into grieving and loss and I knew that I was going to bring the solution to it, I wouldn't be weeping. I would be like, oh man. Like if I was going to walk into a moment where somebody was sick and I knew that God was going to heal them, I wouldn't walk in weeping. I would walk in like, you have no idea what's about to happen. I would walk in full of anticipation, yet the scripture says that Jesus weeps. He weeps. Again, this is a verse that precedes a miracle, and Jesus has a friend by the name of Lazarus, and he is just in a few moments from this moment where he is weeping, he's about to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. And the question we have to ask then is, why is he crying? Why is he weeping if he's just about to raise his friend from the dead? Why is he doing that? You know, the truth is, is that this place of grieving, this place of weeping, this place of mourning is also the place where you will find joy. Not happiness, but joy. A deeper, a rooted sense of joy. You cannot disconnect the pain of this world from the joy of this world. They are forever interconnected. And here we see this moment that Earlier in the story, we learn how Jesus loves. Everyone say, Jesus loves. He loves Martha, and he loves Mary, and he loves Lazarus. And when he hears the news that his friend Lazarus is gravely ill, he doesn't rush. He stays longer in the place where he was, doing what the Father had in his heart to do. And as we continue to read, we see Jesus knows that Lazarus is going to die. But Jesus didn't go right away because he had resurrection on his heart and not healing. Now, Jesus knows this, but the family doesn't. And Lazarus dies. And Lazarus is dead. And Jesus knows what is about to come in terms of this resurrection, but yet he still weeps. He still weeps when he is met with a moment of profound question. Again, it begs the question, why does he weep? And I think there's a few different reasons, really two we're going to look at today. And so pushing further into the story, here's one of the ways that we see or understand why Jesus is deeply moved. When Mary sees that Jesus has arrived in town, she meets him with something we all do if you have followed Jesus for more than 15 minutes. I promise you, you will find yourself in a moment where you will be saying, God, I trust who you are, but I don't know why I'm going through this. God, if you are this, what is this? What is this all about? Why do I have to walk through this? Why am I experiencing this? And in John chapter 11, verses 32, just before where Jesus weeps, three verses before, it says, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him. Everyone see that, say these words, saw him. So when Mary sees Jesus, the question is, what does she see? She falls at his feet, which is really appropriate, but then she says to him these words, Lord, if you had been here, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. 
Lord, if you had just been here, this wouldn't have happened. Now again, if you keep reading ahead in the story and get ahead of me, He's about to raise this brother from the dead, but Mary sees Jesus, but she doesn't see Jesus. She only sees him through the lens of her disappointment. And this is the profound challenge to every human here in person or online who watching today. Every one of us, when you are most disappointed with God is when your vision of God is most blurred. You can fall prey to blaming God or believing he is who he says he is. And there's not one of us that will not go through life without this being profoundly tested in our lives. God, if you are, then why this? And this is what Mary is saying in her grief and in her loss. And when Jesus experiences human disappointment, though he is about to move profoundly, you know what, I absolutely am moved when I look at the story in the life of Jesus, is that when life is unfair, Jesus is never indifferent to the pain of our lives. If he was, then he's not really a great savior or Lord. Here you see Mary and she expresses this disappointment And even though Jesus knows what he's about to do, he is moved with compassion when we as humans experience loss and grief. He's not indifferent to it. So here's what I'm saying. Sovereignty of God. I don't know why you and I have to go through what we do, but I do know this. I may not have every pastoral answer for that, and I don't, but here's what I know that I know that I know about God. He is not indifferent to that which breaks your heart. He's not disconnected from it. He's not dismissive of it. That Jesus sometimes weeps. And sometimes, sometimes, Jesus permits what he hates to lead us to what he loves more. Sometimes the only way perhaps to, for us to see or to experience or to know, sometimes there's just no other way Because if we, our whole life was just about this, like we sing songs like he gives and he takes away, but what we really mean to sing is like he gives and he gives and he gives. Because when he takes away, oh, that stinks. A couple of, like not this Friday, the Friday before our family experienced a loss of our beloved Dave. 12 years Our beloved, some of you are like, what's a Dave? It was our dog. I'm making reference to our dog and, ah, it's loss. And you feel it. You feel it. Walked around the house crying for days. Don't give me any sympathy. I'll start crying up here. (laughs) Crying for days. But in the tears of loss, there, 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 there's, there's joy found. Because there's a connection to a deeper longing that you don't experience when you're just going through life and everything is good. There's something that happens in loss that opens your soul to something that is deeper and is greater and pulls on the inside. It is a great gift to know that God may not have done what we desired, but he is precisely as Isaiah prophesies that Jesus, as we see now back into our story, he, he bears our griefs and he carries our sorrows. Please never say these words in prayer to God. God, I don't want to bother you with my burdens. I know you're busy ruling the universe. He's not too busy for you. Never. You, you, you may feel like, Again, you never have to manage God, okay? Number one, you can't. Number two, you ain't good enough. And number three, he's omniscient. He doesn't need us at all. He is fully self-sufficient in himself. 
In fact, Jesus said it's the opposite. That is, that is not the language of Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, you are weary and heavy laden. My, I don't want to give you rest. You know, Jesus said, cast all of your anxieties on me. From the most profound loss to the loss of a dog. Cast all your anxieties on me. Why? Because I actually care for you. I care for you. And so what do we see in the story here? One thing we see with Jesus is he has a profound care for Mary and for Martha and for Lazarus. Jesus is showing us in example what he said in words. He is not indifferent at all. Like Mary to express disappointment or wonder why something has happened as human but may you equally see that Jesus is both present and moved by our loss and by your grief. May, may your Christmas not be good by what is under the tree. May it be about who this season is all about in the first place. The very first followers of Jesus, of course, were Jewish. And then as it kind of, it pushed away and it pushed in before we had lights and Christmas trees and all these wonderful things that I'm not interested in a culture war against Christmas. It should be Xmas and all that. It's a nonsense. Just keep your heart on Jesus. Amen. I'm not going to get into any of that nonsense. It's just a slide line. It's just distraction. It's more stuff that we can fight over and it's just nonsense. There's real people in real pain and nobody has time for us to be talking about stupid things anymore. Amen. Dumb things. Make no difference at all. No difference at all. I put up a tree, I don't. I don't care. Is Christ at the center of it? To God be the glory. The rest of it's noise and nonsense. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but anyways, but anyways, notwithstanding, it's a reason why the very first followers of Jesus who were Jewish with you know, Hanukkah traditions of the menorah, lighting of the candles, we have the advent. When you begin to see Gentiles get it, the first thing that Christians did in Christmas seasons was not trees. It was to take candles and they put them in their windows and they lit them as a symbol that in the darkness of what is, light has come. In other words, this changes everything. So it's a testimony to your neighbor who's being, going through the pain of divorce. To those who don't believe, it is this witness that light has come. And here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. When Jesus shows up, darkness fears. When tradition shows up, darkness don't care. It don't care. Does nothing to it. But when your abiding hope is more than just happy, but it is a rooted confidence in who Jesus is, then you too can be a light in the midst of any darkness. Why? Because your soul is not rooted in comfort and happiness that is temporal. It is rooted in something that is eternal, that is of ultimate consequence. And perhaps this is the second reason, maybe why Jesus cries. Maybe why Jesus weeps. And I wonder why we as a church no longer, to the degree maybe we should. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit. And it says he was greatly troubled. He had a holy agitation because Hebrews would later write about this same Jesus, that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, three words, yet without sin. And it is yet without sin that gives us maybe another insight outside of just he has a heart that is broken for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Maybe there's a deeper thing that is going on in addition to that, not to remove that. Because as we're about to read, Jesus is about to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. And guess what? In that, there is profound joy. But you know what Lazarus is going to experience again? He's going to die again. He's going to... He raises him from the dead. He's going to die again, Twice. Okay, when I die, do not pray for me to be raised from the dead. 
I'm no longer thinking about you. (laughs) And because of Jesus, when I die, maybe you'll feel a bit of loss if you're still here, but I'm not lost. I am exactly where my heart longs to be. I'm not lost, but we are surrounded by hundreds of thousands who are lost. And maybe, just maybe, maybe, Jesus weeps because though he can raise Lazarus from the dead, he is surrounded by those who are spiritually dead and they have no courage to see it, to own it, to embrace it. Jesus weeps because his greatest desire maybe is not only earthly, but it's eternal. Perhaps he also wept because our view of life is so profoundly limited in comparison to his. A few verses earlier in John 11, when Martha accuses Jesus of not caring, what does he say to her? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Pause feels like Jesus said that backwards, by the way. Like, I should be the life and then the resurrection. I am the resurrection. But no, 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 no. See, your spiritual condition and my spiritual condition outside of Christ is dead. I'm alive. No, you're not. Not according to Jesus, you're dead. So first, you got to be resurrected. You got to be made new to experience and walk in life. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Of course, Jesus is not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual one. So Jesus uses this moment to talk about not just earth, but eternity. So yes, he is connected to us in our grief and our loss. But in grief and loss, you begin to have a longing for something that's not here. Someone that's not here. And it is this longing that is actually an ache for heaven. It is an ache for the presence of God. It is an ache not just for the, it is an ache no iPhone can fill. It is an ache that the best gift will not fill. It's there, but it is a longing for something that is eternal, that is more secure, that is different, that is greater. And this perhaps is what Jesus is articulating here in the story. Death without ever receiving his gift of abounding grace to cover our abundant sin is far worse than just loss on this side of eternity. Lazarus is dead and he is going to rise, but he's going to die again. Yet there are those around him again whose hearts are indifferent to his gift of grace. Mary and Martha are deeply disappointed in what Jesus didn't do. And perhaps Jesus is weeping due to bitter disappointment of what humanity is unwilling to do. If you have family and friends who do not yet know Jesus, I have a promise for you. Jesus is never indifferent to them being lost. He never takes a day off, an hour off, a minute off, a second off, a split second from pursuing those who are lost. Because if they have breath in their body, I promise you they are being pursued by the Holy Spirit of God. The story that we're reading here in John chapter 11, it starts with a familiar question, God, why did you let this happen? But I promise you, no one could see how this story is going to end. And actually, I'm not even talking about the resurrection of Lazarus. I'm talking about something one level deeper. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And so they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up. This is the only prayer I think that Jesus prays that he's still teaching in it, okay? 
Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said this, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. These next words is the longing of my heart and your heart this Christmas. These next words, he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew or I know that you always hear me. Mary, go back. Why is she so disappointed? Because I didn't know if you heard me. I didn't know if you see me. I don't know if you care about me. If you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Look at the different spirit with Jesus. He's right in the midst of it. All these things being hurled at the humanity of Jesus. And he says from joy, a rooted confidence, God, I know that you always hear me because he knows who his father is. And this is what you, this is the gift for you and I at Christmas. This is the deeper place of rooted joy that when you and I pray, that when we worship, that when we lift our hearts, it is father, you are good and I know that you hear me. And so whether my life is at the mountaintop and it's just full of joy and it couldn't get any better, God, I thank you for this joyous gift in life. Or whether I'm going through grief and loss in life that is real, that is profound, and that is painful. Father, I trust that you are good. That you are not distant and disconnected. And when I pray that you hear me, you don't always answer my prayer. And one day you'll show me what it's all about and I'll still say, Lord, you're good. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. A lot louder than I just said it there. <laughs> the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. What a gift, right? Cue the amazement, the awe, the party, the celebration. But it's not how John 11 ends. It's not the end of the story. Imagine it. Everything we've just said, Lazarus, who was dead, not like fictitiously dead, dead, dead. He's standing there in his tomb clothes. Like if there's ever a moment for a worship service, this is it. But it's not what happens. The story in John 11, verse 53 says, so from that day on, they, the religious leaders, made plans to put Jesus to death. What is it about the human heart? That is so indifferent towards God. What is it about my heart? that is so temperamental towards God. If life only happens after we die to ourselves, should our prayer not at Christmas also be, Lord, just help me die already so that I can truly live Abiding in your presence, doing what you've called me to do, seeing the world as you see the world, not just as I see it. One could say Jesus giving Lazarus life, Lazarus life, whew, it's hard for me to say, sealed his own forthcoming death. But this exchange is precisely why Jesus came at Christmas. Our sin, we give him exchange, we get grace, unmerited favor, our falling short, but he fulfills every bit of scripture. For the penalty of sin and death to be removed, for Lazarus to experience not only death, but forever resurrection, which is death no more, Second Corinthians, Paul would write, for our sake, for my sake, for yours. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
John Bloom says, perhaps Jesus, being full of compassion for us and full of hatred for the calamity that sin brings upon us, knows that he will suffer more than we will ever know in order to pay the full cost of our eternal resurrection. So what is the gift of joy in grief in Christ we are talking about today? Well, because Jesus is never indifferent to our loss, we can receive joy even in grief, in loss, trusting that he cares deeply about what breaks your heart and our collective hearts. But the longing that you feel when you look at a circumstance or the world, the longing that you feel when you look and say, this is, but this shouldn't be. The grief that you feel when we don't love one another, but we devour one another. The, the longing that you feel when sin's effects are poured out in a life in a marriage, in a family. This longing, it's not to be lived in, but it's to recognize that there is an ache for someone greater. There is an ache for a world that is not just this one, and it is a profound reminder, though painful, that there is no, that, that, there's nowhere else on the planet that you can buy something to fill this this ache, this longing, it connects us to the joy that Jesus brings is greater, it is deeper, it is richer, it is an anchor, Hebrew says, it is an anchor for the soul in moments that we go through that are good, in moments that we go through that are painful. O holy night, has this lyric that I think is profound for this time. Oh, weary world. And if there's one thing our world is right now, it's weary. Man, as followers of Christ, live on your purpose, yes. Stop trying to fix everything and let God move in here and then be a different presence in this, and that will fix everything. But a weary heart, a weary world, here's the lyric, rejoice, joy. A weary world, rejoice, because there's gifts under the tree. That's not really the lyric. A weary world, rejoice, because your circumstances have changed. No. A weary world, rejoice because your relationship to the status has changed. No. A weary world, rejoice for yonder breaks a new and glorious morning. What's the morning? The morning is this. It was prophesied in Psalms. Though there may be weeping in the night, joy comes in the morning. This is not eternal. Pain and grief is real, but the joy is Jesus is eternal. Jesus is forever. Jesus is what you need. So you can be sitting in grief and sitting in loss around the tree, around what is, and there's that longing and the ache, and you don't have to deny it. Jesus is close, but it is a reminder that, Lord, in you, one day this will be no more. Jesus, in the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he weeps, but you know what Revelation says? One day, weeping will be no more. In fact, he will come to every single one of us, and he will wipe every tear from your eyes. Why? Because the time of grief and loss is over. It is a new time and a new season. So please, this season, if you're going through grief and loss, I'm, I'm not saying like root in it and live in it and like just like stew in it, but what I am saying is there's a gift in it. Not in the circumstance, but there's a gift in it. Sometimes you just need to hush and recognize that this too is holy ground. <laughs>